we need to have records of solar activity going further back in time. Remember, we are talking here over hundreds of years uh, that, that climate change happened. And what you see here is the longest running direct measurement that we have of a solar quantity, which is a very simple one, and that's the number of sunspots. So you take a small telescope, a lousy little telescope, and you look at the sun, well, better not with your eyes, you can project it, or you have a filter or whatever, and you see how many sunspots are there on the sun, and then you use a little formula, and then you get this sunspot number. And people have been doing that since 1610. There is a good reason they didn't do that before, because in 1609, the telescope was invented, so this happened very soon after. The telescope was invented, people discovered sunspots. They were very excited because the sun was supposed to be According to Platonic theory, it was supposed to be a pure body, it's a heavenly body, and now suddenly it had spots on it, right? They're all called maculae, it was, a, it was an error, it was not something that was not supposed to be there. So people were very excited by that because this uh, was a revolution. And so they observed them very carefully. And they found out that you see that the number of spots increases and decreases. And indeed, if you look at the time between two such peaks, it's around 11 years. So it's a solar cycle that I've been showing you with the, with the x-rays. So you see that in the sunspots very well. It's a solar cycle. It's not a solar period. It's not an oscillation exactly, because some of these cycles are longer, others are shorter. But in particular, some are really huge, and others are extremely weak. And there was this period of time, about 1640 and 1700, when there were almost no sunspots. And at the same time, that was the so-called Bonder minimum, when there were no sunspots, was also the time when, at least in Europe, we had the coldest part of the Little Ice Age. Now, again, the Little Ice Age was a time of bitter cold and hunger, and lots of people died. It didn't help that the 30-year war was also going on and people were killing each other, but it was not a happy time. On the other hand, you know, humans tried to make the best of it. Here's a painting by Henrik Averkamp um, of um, skaters on one of the frozen lakes in Grachts in Holland, and you have a lot of these paintings of people skating in winter on these uh, frozen surfaces in this period of time or a bit earlier, it doesn't really happen that much anymore. I spent a sabbatical in, um, in Holland many years ago, well, not that many, but still some years ago, and was looking forward to going skating. It was winter didn't happen because you could go skating in the skating ring, but the canals and the, and the lakes, they didn't freeze. And that seems to be relatively regular. So it's much warmer now than it was at that time. Also, there is another period with uh, weaker sunspots around 1800. That was the last time that the river Thames froze in, in England sufficiently that they could have a Christmas market on it. They built houses and stuff on the frozen river Thames never happened again. But again, you have to be careful, because in the meantime, they've built dams and stuff, and the water flow is different. OK, so over this long period of 400 years, we have a couple of correlations, but it's not really enough. You need to have a much longer time series to be able to say if there is a connection or not. We don't have a direct time series because, as I said, the telescope wasn't there. There are a few naked eye observations of sunspots before that, but it's not very reliable. But luckily, nature provides us with a beautiful way of determining what the sun was doing on longer time scales. And this is through cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays are usually protons, so nucleus of the hydrogen atom shot out in energetic phenomena far away in the Milky Way, some of them even outside, coming from other galaxies, usually being accelerated in supernovae and remnants of supernovae. These are huge exploding stars which can accelerate these particles to basically the speed of light almost. And they're flying through the galaxy. 
Some of them also come into the solar system. Some of them reach the Earth. And if one of these charged, very fast particles comes into the atmosphere of the Earth, its speed, its energy is sufficiently high that as soon as it gets near some constituents of the Earth's atmosphere, it's usually nitrogen, it could be oxygen or argon, but usually nitrogen, the reaction is so energetic that it's a nuclear reaction. That means the nitrogen atom is changed into something else. And there are many different uh, reactions that happen, and it's very complex, as you can see in this, this right one. All these different lines you see are, are different reactions and particles, etc. I'm not going to go into details about that. But once that happens, one of the particles that is produced from nitrogen is a heavy form of carbon, carbon-14. Now, the usual form of carbon is carbon-12, so it has six protons, six neutrons. Carbon-14 has six protons, but eight neutrons. Now, the, this carbon-14 is very famous. It's used for radiocarbon dating. Right? So if you have, you find an archaeologist finds an old piece of wood, you don't know how old it is, but you want to determine when that boat on which, from which this boat was made, for example. You know, you have a Viking boat, which you saw in the Viking Museum. Beautiful things. How do they date them? How do they know exactly how old they are? And one way is you take a little bit of the wood and you find out how much carbon-14 there is in there. How does that help you? Because carbon-14, unless carbon-12 is stable, so carbon, most of the carbon-12 we have on the Earth was produced long ago, before the Earth was formed, and it's still there. However, the carbon-14, after it is formed, within less than 6,000 years, half of it is decayed, goes away. It has a radioact it's a radioactive isotope. And so by determining how much carbon-14 there is, you can find out, okay, originally so much was produced, that is the date. But first you have to know how much was produced. For that you have to know how many of these cosmic rays came and hit the Earth. And that's where the sun comes in. Because as soon as there is, a, there is a region around the sun, a big region, which encompasses all the planets, Pluto and many other objects further out, and that's the region which is dominated by the solar wind. That's called the heliosphere. That's where helios, which is the Greek name for the sun, is dominant. Outside that, it is the galaxy which is dominant. You have the interstellar medium. Right? Now, as soon as the particles come into the heliosphere, because they are charged, they will interact with the magnetic field of the sun, which is going all the way out through the heliosphere. And if the magnetic field is strong, it acts like a shield. It keeps these particles away. So if the magnetic field of the sun is strong, very few of these particles will reach the Earth. If the magnetic field of the sun is weak, very many of these particles will reach the Earth. Few particles means little carbon-14, many particle means a lot of carbon-14. Right? And people, you know, the archaeological community is really interested to know how much of this, this happened because their datings would be all wrong otherwise. So you have to find out how much carbon-14 was produced at a given time. And you can do that again by wood because once the carbon is formed, the carbon-14, it combines with oxygen in the atmosphere, becomes carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide, some of it is taken up by the plants. They release the oxygen, which is good for us because we need the oxygen, and they keep the carbon. Right? And they build up their trunks, their branches, etc. with that. And so your carbon-14 ends up in the tree, and you can tell exactly when. Because every tree has a particular pattern. It's like a fingerprint. And from this pattern, you can tell exactly when this tree lived. Now, I can't tell because it's specialists, right? It's people who devote their life to working out exactly when this was. But you can tell within a year when this happened. So you can work out when how much carbon-14 was formed. You can work out when how many cosmic rays came to Earth. And you can work out how strong was the sun's magnetic field at that time. So how active it was. 
And so to make a long story short, here is a plot of, in blue, so this is starting today and going back 12,000 years. Right? This is the whole Holocene. This is the whole period of time that we have any history or civilization on Earth. Before that, we had the Ice Age. Nobody was doing any agriculture. There were no towns, villages, nothing before that. People were hunter-gatherers. So all of civilization took place in this time. And in blue, you have the carbon-14 production rate, which is a way for saying activity of the sun. So pointing down, the sun was more active, but at periods of time where it's higher up the blue curve, the sun was very inactive. Then you had like a maunder minimum. You had no sunspots, you had no flares, no weak corona, etc. And in yellow is a measure for the climate, for the temperature in the North Atlantic European region. There are some mismatches because determining the date for the temperature is, is rather difficult. But on the whole, you see that then when the sun was inactive, that is when the blue curve goes up, it was usually also very cool, right? Warmer is down, cooler is up. So something like this correlation between the Maunder minimum, no sunspots, inactive sun, and a cool climate is not unique. This has happened many times in the past. This is just one curve. There are many such studies, and they all give the evidence that the sun was playing an important role in affecting climate in the past thousands of years. But for us, it's more interesting, what is it doing now? But for us, it's more interesting, what is it doing now? Did it play a role in producing this global warming that we have just seen and we are living through? And so let me give you a comparison between the total brightness of the sun, how much energy it's sending to the Earth, because that is what's going to influence um, temperature on Earth, or one of the things, and the temperature itself. So here, between 1850 and about 1980, are two curves, or two sets of curves. In blue is the temperature on the Earth. In red, the brightness of the sun. 
And although they run sort of in parallel, and you see that there was a big increase in the temperature between about 1910 and 1940, solar brightness also increased, but a little bit it lagged behind. So it may have contributed to that, but it was not the dominant driver. If you look after 1980, it's even more severe. Temperature, as we saw, has increased drastically since then. But the solar brightness, on average, if you average over the 11 years, has actually been decreasing somewhat. So they've gone completely out of phase. So there is no excuse for saying that this latest increase in temperature that we have, that we can put this down to the sun or other natural causes. 